They're yours. Hit that one more time. I am the number one determinant of the success or failure. Here we go. Of my students. Hey, y'all, you have a strong summer. Kick some butt next year. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. That's the mindset. That's the attitude. Love you guys. And. We are live. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's see who we got in the building this morning. Let's see. We got Takesha High. Let me know where you all are coming from, too. I see Takesha's up there, in, down there in Virginia. Marsha Poe is in the building all the way from San Diego. We got my man, Demetrius Scott. I got to shake his hand, fist bump him out in Birmingham this past what day was that, man? Tuesday. I was getting ready to say Saturday, but today's Saturday. Golf R, what WT is in the building. Yolanda McKinney's in the building. Janine Wilkins all the way out there in Alaska's in the building. Vanessa Zeskin's in the building. Create and educate. I was just watching Dr. Sheikah Houston and soon to be Dr. Tammy Taylor in the building. Kimberly George, uh, Waukegan in the building. Diane D, uh, Dee Dee Pinkett. It's in the building. We have folks from all over the place, man. We got where this thing just took a jump. We got my man Josh Tovar, MPA Jaguars, Buenos Dias in the building. There's Principal Tammy Taylor, South Carolina, holding it down in the building. There's my wife, the queen, Kimberly Broughton Cafele in the building. Solomon ba uh, Bazue in the building. Principal Dot McKeever, McKeever Jeter in the building. Karima Anque out here in Newark, New Jersey in the building. Rodney Richardson, John Herricks, Melissa Jones, Chunu is in the building. Lysandra Brackens, Lys uh, Lys Lashonda Renee Thomas, Rashad Davis. All the way from Vegas, man. It must be hot out there, Rashad, man. It was, I was, all the states, I was in four states this week, and it was 100 in every one of them. But I wasn't out west, you know, I wasn't in your area. So, um, but I'm, but in Jersey, it's about 66 right now. It's incredible. Uh, what else we got here? What else we got, man? I skipped around. LaQuinta Coleman is in the building. Tara Blackshire Scott, I saw you. On Tuesday in Birmingham, I saw all my Alabama peeps out there. Good to see you, Tara. Uh, let's see, let's see. Enorb, I'm messing this one up. Uh, Lyra, uh, Ronim is in the building out there in Vegas. I accept my apology for butchering up your name. Ver Verlin John is in the building. Out there in Trinidad and Tobago. I told y'all, man, we international. So Trinidad and Tobago's in the building. Let me let me let me let me tell you, Verlin. Uh, 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 Verlin, I don't know if you were there when I was there last, but that one strip that kind of that middle strip that gets you back and forth, and and they gave me that car and said here, and 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 the steering wheel was on the opposite side. <laughs> I was like, no, no, I couldn't drive that one. So they had to uh, they had they they had to they had to, they had to show for me on that trip. I tried it. And it, I, I just couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle it. Kevin Lo, uh, Ke Kevin Lovett in the building. Uh, Stephanie Hinton's in the building. My man Lou Saunders is in the building. Alan Coward, Natalie Romana, uh, Jaded, Jaded. Man, I messed that up. I know I did. Matthew Tabor. What, now, this caught my attention. Woodbridge, New Jersey. Man, I went to Woodbridge High School, y'all. You know, those that know my story, I went to four high schools. I went to four different elementary schools, four different high schools. I went to eight schools, not including preschool. So, you know, I got around. But I graduated from Woodbridge High School. Man, I got stories. I can keep you all on here for the next five hours talking about them days. Um, where we at? It's, it's, it's 11.02. I got to get going, y'all. Hafiz. Melton is in the building. I had his daughter, man, in, in uh, middle school. 
and high school, and she's doing big things, man. Big things. Let's we got we got Trina, uh, Ar 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 Arsenal in the building. T uh, Ty Scott Davis. I might have messed that up. My man Dennis Griffin is in the building. Dennis, you on that list, man? That list is just long in terms of my my future guests to come on the platform, but you are on it. We just we just got to schedule it, right? But you on there, man. I got you. Know, I got people. They need to hear. They need to hear a good word from Wisconsin. And Candace Norwood, look here, y'all. It's that time, man. Hit that share button for me. Hit that retweet button for me. Let them know it is that that time of the day. It's Saturday when we have the virtual AP Leadership Academy. So let me ratchet it up for a little bit and say to you formally now, good morning. Greetings. Welcome to week one. 112. Man, can y'all believe that? 112 of the virtual AP Leadership Academy. And I don't know about you, but I think I know. I mean, you're here. But if I could just give me a second, let me just speak for me. I want you to know how I feel this morning because I hope it resonates with everybody on here. I'm on fire. Woo! Woo! I got to get that out every Saturday, man. I got to get it out every Saturday. It was it was a it was a long week, but it was a great week. Like the the great week was, man. Shout out to Missouri Leadership Academy in Columbia, Missouri, class convention in Birmingham, Alabama. Decatur Public Schools in, in Decatur, Illinois, and the Kentucky Behavior Institute in Louisville, Kentucky. That's how I spent my week. That's the fire part. But that airline travel, oh, man. Cancellation this, delay that, get in at bed at 3 o'clock, got to get up at 6 and speak and bring the best version of myself that's that's the you know that's the hard part man you know but you know this this is what i do it's really all i know so i just gotta i got i gotta grin and bear it and make it happen right so i just want to mention that let me give you my quick motivational message my commentary whatever i'm calling it these days today is june 18th tomorrow's june 19th it's known as juneteenth i want to say this to you I discovered Juneteenth in 1984. 1984, as I was, I, I was just a heavy-duty reader for a couple decades of African American history. So it popped up earlier. Demetrius talking about when I was doing that two-step in Birmingham, Frankie Beverly and Mays, we all won. You know, I get on that stage and I get a little loose, y'all. Right. So, so anyway, I discovered it around that time. And then I've known of it, been 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 a been a supporter of it um, ever since. But many people in America and beyond discovered Juneteenth in 2020, and then it soon after became a holiday, national holiday. Here's my question to you: When did you discover Juneteenth? If it was recent, then I want you to do this. I got my mirror here. I brought this with me on, on this trip. Uh, you know, I bring it on all my trips. This it go, This is my companion, the mirror. And I, want, I got to hold a mirror up to you. And I want you to ask yourself, when did you discover Juneteenth? Now, I'm not just talking to the folks on here who are African-American. I'm talking to everybody on here. And I'm talking to everybody who will see this video. When did you discover it? And if you did not, or, or forget discover, when did you learn about it? I discovered it. But when did you learn about it? If you learned about Juneteenth recently, I want you to hear me well. If you learned about Juneteenth recently, then I want you to ask yourself, why so? I mean, literally, why did it take you so long? Because everybody on here I'm going to assume is an adult. Why did it take so long for those of you that just learned about it recently? Like, like I'm looking at Candace. She said when I was a student at Hampton, right? Good example here. So, so why when you were in college? What about when you were in high school? And I don't mean you 
stumbling on it like I did. I mean, someone teaching it to you. Why didn't, why didn't, why weren't you exposed to it in high school or middle school or elementary school or whenever? Why is it that so many of us got it so late? Here's my point. Juneteenth is just a small portion of the bigger narrative of the history of black people in this country. Why? Are so many of us learning about the story, about the history, about the experience, about the reality so late in our lives, right? Why isn't it a part of curriculum when we're children? That's my question. That's just, it's just my rhetorical question at that. But you, of course, you can put your, your, your responses in the chat if you would like to. But I'm just, you know, I'm just giving you that food for thought. Particularly, I'm, 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 I'm countering everything, er, everything about critical race theory that folks have this the new narrative of critical race theory that we've heard a, just just throughout the past couple of years. Teaching Juneteenth is not critical race theory. Teaching Juneteenth is teaching American history. Let me say that to you one more time and I'm going to step off because that's not my topic today. Teaching Juneteenth is not critical race theory, but you cannot teach Juneteenth and not talk race. It's impossible. It is absolutely impossible to talk Juneteenth and not talk race. You, you, you cannot do it. So if you're going to talk about Juneteenth, you have to talk about race relations between blacks and whites. You have to. If you don't, then you're not telling you're, you're not being honest in your in, 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 in your conveying the story of Juneteenth, right? So I'm, so I'm saying that because I, you know, I, I know we got diversity that checks in every Saturday morning and, 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 I, and I try to keep it real on here every Saturday morning, even though some of the topics uh, have nothing to do with something like this, but I still want to infuse it because it's so necessary. You're going back to real life schools and your real life schools are not just instructional leadership, for example. There's so many other aspects, so many other components to to, to educating young people. And one of those components in this case, and then I'm going to close this, is teaching American history honestly. See, bringing the fullness of what American history is, that it's inclusive of everybody that comprised this country that we call America. Enough said. Let's move on. Welcome to the first timers. Glad you're here. In fact, I'm elated that you're here keep on coming right don't let this be your last time let this let this if this is your first hey dr chester if this is your first keep on coming back come back to your second next week right and just keep on coming because we got so much information oh man I'm, I'm seeing names on here that i don't like see on a regular and i don't do shout outs now but like sometimes you just got to stop for the royalty man like when i saw dr chester i see alicia booker man what are you doing here, Alicia Booker? Maybe you here and you just haven't had your, made a comment. But when I said Juneteenth in America, the fullness of American history, as you wrote, you said, I got to say something. Good to see you, Alicia Booker. East Orange, homie in the building by way of it. Well, now in Atlanta, but but you homie. You know, you know how that works. I'm in Jersey City, but East Orange is what I breathe, right? What I bleed. So, so yeah, first time is I'm glad you're here. Hey, y'all. June, tw July 12 and 13 is around the corner. You know, the, um, the <laughs> Alicia, I, you know, the, this, this, the school leadership Institute, that's mine. We taking the school, the virtual AP leadership Academy on the road. We call it the school leadership Institute. It's us in person in the room for two days, July 12 and 13 in beautiful Charlotte, North Carolina. So go to my website, principalcafele.com. Scroll down on the homepage, click the link that says School Leadership Institute with Principal Cafele and, and, and register and then join me in Charlotte for two days where we just going to talk leadership, man. Two days. This is the fifth annual. I do this every year. So two days, Charlotte, North Carolina. We got a, we got a, we got a nice number of people that's going to be there already, but I want to see some more. So just go to principalcafele.com, click the link, um, School Institute with Principal Cafele. Join me July 12 and 13. And then those of you, because a lot of you ask me, when can I come see you speak? 
um, in the in the summer conferences. Well, I got all the links on my homepage. So all the public summer conferences, just click the link. Like I'm keynoting the National Charter School. I know this is not the exact title. I'll give it to you later. The National Charter School Association annual conference. I'm a, I'm a, I'm keynoting that this Tuesday in D.C. Come on out to D.C. Those of you who are local, right? Or I mean, yeah, you gotta be local. You fly a plane, right? Just hopefully it's not canceled. But come on to D.C. Tuesday, I'm going to do a leadership session in the morning, and then I'm going to keynote the conference in the afternoon at three o'clock, and then I'm off to Orlando, Florida to talk to uh, educators down there. So come come join me. You can go right to my website, click the link for the National Charter School Association Conference. Join me in D.C. Let's dap it up, man. Let's take some pics. Let's interact. And then I got to bounce. I got to get on the plane. So I hope to see some of you down in D.C. on Tuesday. Congrats to all the folks getting these jobs, man. I'm getting all these emails. I'm getting all these DMs. I'm getting all these inboxes. Folks are getting hired. So congratulations to you. But do know the real work starts once you get in there. Don't forget that. It ain't just getting hired. Now you got to roll up your sleeves, man, in the real heavy lifting. That's what me and my man going to talk about today, Pete Hall, right? In a few minutes, the real heavy lifting is going to start then, right? Um... I'm almost done, y'all. I got it. I got, you know, I always got to do this, man. I got, I, I got eight books I wrote sitting down here. I just show y'all three of them. The Equity and Social Justice Education 50. Get your hands on it, man. The, the Assistant Principal 50. Get your hands on it if you don't have it. And the Aspiring Principal 50. Get your hands on it. Amazon, get the secondary device right now and just go right to it and get your copy, right? And then I'm rocking the Pittsburgh Crawfords. Negro Leagues, man. This is like an alt, alternate jersey, though. This ain't the real one. I'm wear, I wear my alternates over the summer, right? So, but it's still, it's still representing the Pittsburgh Crawfords Negro League team. With that being said, I am done. I got my man on today, Pete Hall, coming from Idaho. I've only been there twice, but I've been there. That's the thing. I've been there. Right. And uh, we're going to talk a little building leadership capacity. So let me let me let me get him up here. And he is in the building on Pacific time. So it's early in the morning. But he said, that's all right. I'm used to it. So I'm here. So, Pete, my man. Good morning. Principal Cafele. Good morning to you and good morning to your host of fans, your adoring fans that are here today to listen to you preach this man, morning. I, man. I, I mean, People say that. I just say my colleagues that I love, man, you know, my, my slightly younger colleagues is, is, is looking for some information so that they can go back to the school. And and, and it's a beautiful thing because, um, as you probably know, I was doing this solo for a year. Yeah. And, and I was loving it. And I had enough content to probably take me till I'm about 70. Right. But then I said, you know. These are my perspectives for these 52 weeks I was doing it for a year. I said, other people have their own perspective, which are, which are extremely valuable. So I opened this thing up and I started bringing on guests. Now, my mom, who I know she's watching, my mom was like, you know, you need to stop bringing so many guests on. Like, like the people want to hear you, right? But, 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 but see, what my mother was really saying, because she, see, she said the people want to hear me. But here's what she's really saying. She's saying... I want to hear you. <laughs> right. She's saying, I miss you. Because, son. Mom, we just hung up the phone a few minutes ago. So I said, I said, Ma, I said, they got to hear these other voices, man. They got to hear these other, other perspectives. So I've been bringing on people that I call heavyweights. I don't just, I don't just let's call anybody say, come on the platform. If you on here, <laughs> that means I respect you like up here somewhere. Right. And that's why you're here this morning, man, because you, you've been putting in some work. So before I even let, let the folks hear your bio, Pete, as I always ask my guests, I know you had, you know, I, I know every week has got its challenges in our lives, whether it be personal, whether it be professional or a combination of whatever it is. But I also know that people like yourself experience victories. So what I want to ask you real quick, give us a win that you had last week that somebody can benefit from the win that you had. What's the win you had? Uh, <clears throat> I'm glad that you asked me that, uh, because I had a, I had a big win last week, you know, and I do a lot of what you do professionally and I'm, I'm out and I'm speaking, I'm a former school principal and all that business. 
And uh, one of the things that you and I both do when we have that quote unquote downtime yeah. is we write, right? Yeah. We, we write the things that we think are gonna change people's lives and try to provide some kind of value to somebody's journey. And last week I submitted a manuscript that I have been working on for over five years. Wow. So it's been a huge, huge project. And it was, it's one of those things, and you know what this is like when you do that, you're like, once you send it off to the publisher, it's like, okay, that's it. I mean, there's, there's really going to be not a whole lot more editing or revising or anything. It's, this is the thing. And so there's a lot of trepidation. Is it ready? Did I, did I phrase everything the wanted the way I wanted it to? Is it, does it project the right message? And uh, I sent it off last week. So I've got, um, that's coming and it's a testament to just sticking with it. I mean, that's a project that has been really, really challenging for me. And it's, um, I think it's really, really powerful and I'm extremely excited about it. And it, uh, it's one of those moments that like I wipe my brow and I'm like, okay, well, now I'm, I'm waiting to get it back and we'll see what it looks like when I get it back. And I'll have one last little round to go after it. And, uh, man, I'm just, I'm just super proud that I have that. And I'm really, I can't wait for folks to be able to read it and hopefully benefit from it. That, see, that's that's a win, and congratulations to you. That's that's a big win. Let, 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 let me holler at somebody out here right now regarding your win. I'm willing to bet of the number of people who are watching right now and the folks who will see the video later, I would, I'm willing to bet there's at least five people, maybe more, who have started a project of some, of some sort and stopped for whatever the reason. It's, it, you, you didn't finish. You started a project. It could have been a book. It could have been a blog, blog post. It could have been a video. It could have been an article. It could have been any, or it could be something unrelated to writing. But you started some project that was dear to you, and life got in the way, meaning you got in the way of yourself. And now that thing which you were so gun ho about getting done, it's not happening. So let that win a Pete that the book is done. Let the, take that incorporate into you and go back to that project and get it done to completion. Right. Not 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 another plateau, but to completion so that now you can take whatever it is you're doing to another level. Right. I appreciate you sharing that. Let me tell them who you are, Pete, for those that don't know, because a lot of them do know because I was reading, you know, I post this on like 12 different Facebook pages and put, folks are like, oh, my God, Pete Hall. One of them, you know, one that really stood out for me, Pete, one said. They, they tagged some other people. They said, Pete, Pete's, Pete Hall, particularly as it relates to his reflective approach, you got to listen to Pete. I'm like, oh, man, they, they not only know Pete by name, they know his stuff. Right? They know his <laughs> content. Right. Yeah, yeah. So here we go. Pete Hall is a capacity builder. Driven to impact others' lives in a profoundly positive way, he channels his experiences as a school principal life coach and small business owner into manageable lessons for continuous growth, personal improvement, and positive mindset. Tenacious, courageous, and incorruptible. I got to say that word again. Incorruptible. Pete shares his optimism, joy, and practical application of strategies for getting the most out of yourself. As a leader, and a, as a, leader a contributor, a teammate, and a human being, no matter what your role or roles and goal or goals might be. With a down-to-earth personality and humorous anecdotes, he weaves tactical work-life approaches and clear, mental sh and clear mental shifts into every nook and cranny of his interactions with others. After, te after a teaching career that spanned grades pre-K to eight over three states, Mr. Hall served 12 years as a principal in three schools, Anderson, El Anderson Elementary, in uh, Washoe County, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, Reno, Nevada School District, Sheridan Elementary, and Shaw Middle in the Spokane Public Schools. Uh, under his leadership, each of the schools earned awards for academic performance, growth, and student achievement. Mr. Hall's written books, in, uh, written works include authoring over 20 articles on leadership and pu publishing 11 books. He is currently working on his 12th book, as was said, Always entitled, Always Strive to Be a Better You. Again, Always Strive to Be a Better You, subtitled, How Ordinary People Can Live Extraordinary Lives. A resident of, uh, he told me, I'm going to mess it up, 
quarter <laughs> quarter lane court no yeah that is it court, yeah, court lane yeah. idaho he speaks and consults internationally there it is i wrote the phonetics in a different paragraph um for his tenacious and for his tenacious and courageous leadership mr hall has honored has been honored with ASCD's Outstanding Young Educator Award, Nevada's Martin Luther King Jr. Award, and Phi Delta Kappa's Emerging Leaders Award, among others. He was appointed to the Governor's Commission on Excellence in Education in Nevada and was selected to sit on the National Education Association's Great Public Schools Indicators Advisory Panel. He holds a National Principal Mentor Certificate from NAESP, a National Association of Elementary School Principals, and serves as a trainer and coach for NAESP's PALS Mentoring Program. He also provides extensive professional development services as an ASCD faculty member. Finally, Mr. Hall has worked as a personal consultant, mentor, motivational coach for school leaders, teachers, professional athletes, weekend golfers, stand-up comedians, firefighters, business executives, custodians, and more. A current resident of Coeur d'Alene, no, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, Coeur d'Alene. He speaks and consults internationally. Woo, that's a lot there. There Get was a lot. Information, more information from educationhall.com and www.fosteringresilientlearners.org and strive ss.com we'll, we'll we'll get more of that in at, at the conclusion and you can contact him by email at pete hall at educationhall.com and follow him on twitter at education hall so we'll re certainly repeat that that's a lot pete and you know the one that obviously intrigues me i i, I well you'd have to know me this, for that to be obvious but the one that intrigued me has nothing to do with education and, I, and i'm sure it intrigued a lot of other people when it talked about you being that either personal coach personal consultant, mentor, motivational coach for a stand-up comedian, right? That, um, that's different. Yeah, I, I haven't read a bio like that that, that, that mentioned the stand-up comedian, you know, so I, that, that's got to be interesting. It's got to be intriguing work um, in, in, in working with a comedian. And it, and, it, and it also says to me that you know something about that, that whole industry of being a comic. Well, that's a funny thing. And let me just take a moment because you were exhausted reading my bio. Right? <laughs> imagine trying to, to juggle all that and, and balance all that and keep that all afloat, right? There's a lot for me, too. And I think the interesting thing is you also mentioned um, how your mom had said she wants to hear you talk more. Well, my mom wrote that bio. So there's, oh. there's a lot of stuff there. You know? There's a lot. Of stuff. And it all sounds very flattering. And I appreciate that you made it through that and you pronounced Coeur d'Alene pretty much accurately. Also, the little appreciate town where I live. Up in appreciate Idaho. that. Appreciate that. Let's you know, and yet, can I just tell you about the, yeah, yeah. the, the stand-up comedian deal? So it's kind of an interesting um, situation where the work that, that I've done, similar to the work that you do, is about building capacity in others and about building leadership capacity and helping folks be the best at whatever it is they wanted to do and what they want to be. And one of the foundational pieces that I operate out of is the idea of developing reflective growth. So asking people, and you, you showed your mirror a little bit ago, you got that cute little blue mirror you take with you on the road. I'm sure that's for shaving the, the top yeah. right off, right? Yeah. Keeping things smooth and, and yeah. sharp too. Um, and that's, that's one of the biggest tools that we have is the opportunity to look at ourselves and to truly deeply reflect and ask ourselves some tough questions about who am I? What am I all about? Um, and even bringing it back to the, the project, my five-year project to get this book done. And you challenged our listeners today and our viewers today to go back to completion, go find what that project is that you've started, go back to completion. I would pose this question to folks. Why did you start it in the first place? Yeah. What was your mindset in the moment that you said, I want to do this, right? I want to focus on this. I want to get this done. I want to accomplish this. I want to build this. I want to create that. I want to support this. I want to finish. What was it that got you started? And that's the piece that is going to drive you through those moments where you mentioned plateau, or if you run into an obstacle or you think, oh my gosh, I'll never do this, or I'm not good enough. Who am I to do this, right? Get a little imposter syndrome or whatever it is. 
all those little pieces are overcomable by connecting back to our initial purpose. And when we have that, and I think that's the beauty of this work is that I don't, I, I, I'm not really that funny of a guy, Rudy. So I don't know a lot about the, the comedy industry. What I can tell you is I know about human beings and I know about people and I know what drives people and I know how to ask the right question that drives your reflective growth, that spurs you into action. Because yeah. I'm not the kind of coach or consultant or mentor who is going to tell anybody what to do. I will ask you why it's important to you. I will ask you what you think is the most important part of it. I'll ask you how you could figure out what the next step might be. And I will work with you to try to figure that out. And that's why I can coach a stand-up comedian without being funny and without knowing anything about stand-up comedy. And it's, it's that spirit that has really led me throughout the entirety of my career, which allows me to not have to be the expert in the room. And I don't have to know everything about whatever's going on in this, in this setting with this group of people, as long as I can ask the right questions and we can work it out together. We can figure some of that business out. So, I love it. And you, you know, you, you, you almost forcing me to take my notes and put them in the garbage. But I'm, I'm but I'm a, I'm a stay I'm I'm a stay with them because since I spent a whole week putting it together. But you, you, go. <laughs> you, got, you got you got me fired up now about everything that you just say, you know. And and I just want to go back to that question that you posed: Why did you start it in the first place? You know, you, you somebody out there that that you you haven't you you, you put something down. You I mean first you said I'm ready, and then you put it down. You put it away. You got discouraged. You became frustrated or you became overwhelmed with, 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 with the things you're doing, life, work, uh, raising children, whatever it is. But why'd you start it in the first place? And that's that why. That's that reason. That's that because. That's that purpose. Why did you start it in the first place? I agree with Pete that that's your go-to question in terms of picking it back up. I purposely left Johnny Sadler here on the screen because he said back in school now at 59, right? Back in school at 59. See? Love that. So going to resume the work as opposed to, ah, I'm too old now. What am I doing in a school, right? No, I'm going back. So I'm going to ask you all one more time. Why did you start whatever it is in the first place? And sometimes that's where we got to start. We got to go back to that first in order for the work to make sense. And if, if we don't go back to the why, the work may not really make sense. Justifying putting in that work, that toil to completion. I know you're trying to jump in there, Pete. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to I, echoing what you're saying. And you got to hold up that mirror and see if you can bring yourself back to the mindset that you had. So what were you thinking? What was going on in your heart? What was going on in your head? What was going on in your life that caused you to create this goal in the first place? I mean, that if you can emotionally put yourself back in that place, oh my gosh, then things start rolling for you. It starts rolling. And I, I can tell you, I can, I can go up on stage and I can do my best Baruti Kafele impersonation and I can be as motivational and I can get you you know, fired up. And I love the video that you have at the intro because that is so you just firing people up and getting them ready. There is a subtle and, but significant difference between motivation and inspiration. Yeah. And, you, and you know this really well. And probably most of our viewers know this too. Motivation is something that I could do for you. I can motivate you to do something. You know, Principal Kefele can motivate you to go back to your vision and, and think about, okay, what's my why here? Why did I start this in the first place? You, you, whoever you are watching and, and listening to this right now, the inspiration is up to you. You have to find that source of energy and passion and interest and commitment in yourself. And we can help you. We can ask you the right questions that surface that. And we can provide just the right amount of energy and enthusiasm to cause you to do that. You're the one that has to do it. So when we... When you think about, oh, I'm going to go to this presentation, I'm going to go to this workshop, and I'm going to get fired up, I'm going to get inspired. I don't know if you're going to get inspired. You might become motivated. Yeah. And our hope is, and our expectation is, you'll be motivated to unpack your own inspiration for what you need to do. You don't need me. You don't need Kefele. You don't need 
anybody on TV. You don't need someone else to inspire you. That's that's yours. Your inspiration comes from you. And that's that's what's the difference between starting a project and finishing a project is having that inspiration guide you and keeping you going. And I, I see you keep putting my man Dennis Griffin up there. Yeah, yeah. And you talk about bringing Dennis on the show. I actually did a um, – I invited Dennis to be a part of a panel that we hosted this summer for our Sir Trauma Institute. And Dennis, as always – is fantastic up there in Brown Deer in Wisconsin. Yeah. Dennis is an amazing, amazing man. And so he he's is. like like you and like me. He's got a good haircut and he's got a good yeah. head on his shoulders. That's it. That's it. No, Dennis is that <laughs> Dennis is that dude. Man, we're gonna get him on here. Yeah, Dennis is that guy. So you all look out since we since we both referenced him, go to his Facebook page, Dennis Griffin Jr. and check him out. Uh, I don't know if he has a website up there yet. He probably does, but go to his Facebook page and check him out. He's a uh, solid principal up in Wisconsin, Wisconsin. Let's go, Pete. As an educator, who is Pete Hall? You know, um, I think you got it in the first line of my bio. Pete Hall's a capacity builder. Right? I think from from the get-go, my, my purpose in becoming an educator was to make people's lives better somehow, to, to change the trajectory of kids' lives, to shift the narrative of certain neighborhoods, um, and, to, and to help build Teachers, educators, uh, parents, families, kids, whatever they want to become. I, that's, uh, I mean, that has always been the driving factor. I, I've never done it for me. I never even really wanted to be a principal. You know, honestly, I didn't even want to be a teacher. I wanted to be a baseball coach. That was my thing. Well, I wanted to be a baseball player. That didn't work out. So then I wanted to be a baseball coach. And the closest thing to being a coach was a teacher. And so long story short, you know, I've traveled this path is just trying to find an avenue to connect with people in, in the, the greatest way that I can. So all these different positions and job titles and opportunities, just opportunities to build capacity. Love it, love it. I left this young man up here, Stephen Webb. It's Dr. Stephen Webb. Hmm. Um, I just wanted to highlight him real quick. He said he earned his doctorate at 55. When I started teaching my second stint, I started in Brooklyn in 1988, New York City. But then I I, I, re, I did a reset and came back home to Jersey. And in 92, the 92, 93 school year, I was at a school called Ashland Elementary as a sixth grade teacher that first year. And this young man, Stephen Webb, he was the head custodian. Right. He was the head. He was the head custodian of that the school. Is amazing. Yeah. So he he had a bigger vision for himself. So he went on and went to school, became a teacher became a principal, became a pastor. He has his own church. He's a pastor now as well. And then went on and got, a, got his doctorate degree, as he said, at age 55. So if there's somebody out there and life is, 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 is presented its challenges to you, whatever they may be, just know that when I was in my early <laughs> stages as a teacher, my head, the head custodian, he wasn't my head custodian because I wasn't principal yet, but he and I became very friendly, right? So, so the head custodian was was what had 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 a vision that I knew nothing about at that time, and now here he is, just had his graduation. I was looking at some pictures of his most recent class graduating with him as the principal, as Doctor Wed, right? So don't 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 tell me we can't get it done. Ooh, we can it. get it done. But it goes back to that question. Why did you start in the first place? Like, like notice Webb said it took longer than expected, but got it done. So sometimes, you know, it may take longer. Sometimes we may stop it. But the question is, will you resume it? Why will you get it done? And, and Dr. Webb, I, I, I meant I should have said you're on that list, too. It's just that list is long. man. I got so many people I want on this platform. So you're on it. <laughs> I just haven't called you yet. But I'll be calling you at some point. Let's go. Let's go, uh, Pete. So, so Pete, you, you pretty much answered my second question. If there's something that you wanted to add, these are these three preliminaries that I give everybody. Okay. What made you enter the field of education? But And, 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 and you, 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 you kind of addressed that. But what continues to fuel your passion for the work that you do? I think it's two things. One is uh, just my like I mentioned, that intrinsic desire to want to help people and to change people's lives and to help them become what they want to become. And I love your story of, of Dr. Webb 
And I, I can't wait until he's on the program to hear his journey. Um, and there's a, a bazillion stories out there that we know about of lives that we have touched and impact that we've made. And there are even more stories out there that we don't know where we believe and we trust and we have faith in the fact that the work that we have done has had a positive impact on other people. So that's one piece of it. And then another piece of it is we have a tremendous need. We have a tremendous need to build people up. And there's so much divisiveness and there's so much negative rhetoric that gets you know, thrown about like it's, you know, like popcorn in the movie theater, right? It's, it's almost like we're just, we're just tossing this negativity around and we need more positive energy and we need more folks that are willing to stand up and say, hey, let's just, let's be good to each other. You know, we're traveling in this hurtling sphere together. So let's act like we're together on this. And I just think there's so much need for that, that any opportunity we have to infuse some positive energy into this and to and to try to help shift systems one way or another. I just want to be a part of it. I love it. I love it. You know, you went on and became a principal. And a lot of us become principals for just a variety of different reasons. You know, I had mine, I had multiple lead reasons, but within <laughs> my my multiple different reasons that I that got felt I had was called to lead, I had something that was very central that was very personal, that was really what pulled me into that level of educator as a principal. So my question to you is, of the reasons that you decided or were called to lead, was there one that kind of drove that energy that you said, I want to lead, but it's really because of this thing that I've got to make this thing happen. Did, did, Did you have one of those? I think more than anything else, it was um, I was kind of ushered into the principalship. I don't know if you had the same experience that I never asked for any of the I didn't ask for an assistant principalship. I didn't ask for a principalship. I was invited. I said, you know, by folks that said, hey, you've got this uh, mm. this ability. You've got this capacity. Do this. Come join us. And I, thought, I don't know if that's something that I want to do. You know, I like the impact that I have. I want to I want to change the trajectory of one kid's life in my classroom. And then I wanted to change the trajectory of, you know, a couple kids classes and then every kid. And then I'm thinking, well, okay, assistant principal, maybe I could change the trajectory of multiple classes, lots of yeah. kids. And then as a principal is even, even more. And this is why I do what I do now. I have the opportunity to speak to principals and work with principals and superintendents and whole school systems. So I, I it's just the idea of impacting trajectories and changing mindsets of, and that's the that's the thing. I mean, I can't wait to like I said, Dr. Webb's story is going to be fantastic. And all the you know, the stories that we have out there, so many of us, what halts us is our own mindset about what we believe we can do and what we're worthy of accomplishing. Yeah. And a lot of times we like you said at the intro, we get in our own way. And that's what halts us. That's what stops us. And we might even say, oh, I really want to do this and this would make a big difference for me. But, and we just need to scrap whatever comes next. Never mind the but. You know, I really want to do that. Okay, that's all you need. Now it's time to come up with a strategic plan to make that happen. And if there's obstacles in the way, do it. And I think that's that's probably the central theme of all my work is about just changing and impacting people's lives in a positive way, however that looks. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I love it. You know, you know in, in your book, and I, my copy is sitting on a table over here, so I'm going to get it when you respond so I can put it on the screen. But in the book, The Principal Influence, which you co-authored, as I went through the book, the, the bulk of the book is devoted to building a principal leadership capacity. And that's the part, that, that's the portion of the book that I really gravitated to in terms of just reading, generating questions, and just my <laughs> overall interest in the book, building principal leadership capacity. So my, my first question to you then, what is meant by that term, leadership capacity? What does that mean? Well, um, really what we're talking about when we talk about leadership capacity is the expansion of our potential. So in the, in the big scheme of things, we tend to think of Uh, we're reaching for our potential. We're trying to become as much as we can possibly be. And 
when we're working on building leadership capacity, it's the capacity to impact others. It's the capacity to grow others. It's the capacity to affect change in a positive way. And the more we learn, the better we can do and the more impact we can have. So it's, it's this idea of capacity and potential kind of growing at each other. And the, the thing that I've found about potential is I've done more and more research about this idea is the closer we get to our potential, the more our potential expands. So I do believe we will never actually meet our potential. We'll never actually hit the ceiling. We'll never actually max out, which is why, and I'm a big sports fan like you are. I'm, I am a believer in the fact that there is no record in sports that will not be broken. Right. That could not be broken. So I'm a believer in, in baseball, for instance. I'm a believer in a 57-game hitting streak. Right? Joe DiMaggio in 1941 had a 56-game hitting streak, and that's often revered as baseball, if not sports, unbreakable record. I'm a believer that you could beat that. You could get a 57. I mean, all it takes is the right conditions, the right situation. Why put a ceiling on it and say there's no possible way that we could do that? Yeah. And I, I'm a believer in that same mindset with everything we do. When we talk about schools, when we talk about kids, when we talk about how much they can learn, when we talk about an individual teacher and how much difference he or she can make, I think that there's, there's as soon as we say, well, that's it, that's my potential. I've maxed out my potential. And if we look at children and we say, this is this kid's potential, this is as far as that kid can go, I think we are really doing a disservice. So yeah. when we talk about building leadership capacity, it's about unveiling the current potential and the idea that potential like an asymptote continues to increase and expand the closer we get to it. So there's never an upper limit to anything we do, anything we can accomplish or anywhere we want to go. Man, you know, I, I want to stay there because I want to, I, I want to reinforce what you just said for someone that may have missed that. You don't max out. And, and, and some of us think, you know, we do, we, we evolve, you know, I'm, I, you know, I, I was just having a conversation the other day, Pete, with someone, uh, we were talking about one of my old principals from back in this same town that Webb and I are from East Orange, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And my principal in middle school, 70, 73 and 74 is still a principal. What? Yeah, he 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 he's eighty. Hey, where how old is 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 um uh, is, is 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 he? He's um he must be about eighty six now. Wow, eighty eight years old, right? He was Whitney Houston's principal, right? And um, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's you know, so he's probably not the same guy he was when he was younger. But he has evolved, but within that evolution, he can still grow, which is what you're saying, right? So we evolved. Kobe Bryant didn't retire as 25-year-old Kobe Bryant, but he was still great. Same goes with Michael Jordan, but he had to evolve and then, and then continue to improve with the evolution. So we, we don't max out, folks. 86 years old. That right, we 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 don't max out. We so 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 don't think you're gonna get to this point where okay, I I, I can't grow anymore. No, nah. and that's all falls under this umbrella of leadership capacity. So so given Pete that the you know I created this 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 platform for the assistant principal in particular, mm -hmm. the aspiring principal in particular. Um, where am I at? Yeah, the assistant principal. How do, how do we go about building leadership capacity within that role? Because in some places, as you know, that role could be very complementary to the principal. Mm -hmm. In other places, that role could be something very different from the principal. And that's the one I frown upon. And that's probably why, no, it's not probably it's why I created this platform. How does that person go about building leadership capacity, particularly when you're in a situation where you're not being given the full exposure to leadership? Yeah, so there's two ways of looking at that, uh, right? One is from the assistant principal perspective. So if, if you're an assistant principal and you want to grow and you want to become a principal, two questions that I would ask um, you to reflect on. And if I had a little blue mirror, I'd hold up a little blue mirror right now. One is, why do you want to be a principal in the first place? 
So what is it that you want to do with that principalship? What is, what is that platform going to be different? How is that platform going to be different as far as a way to impact people and change lives? And that's, that's the first question is why do you want to become that principal? And I tell you, I have, I have uh, worked with folks who wanted to become a principal and then became a principal just to have the, the name tag sitting on their desk or on their, on their door and just feel like they have achieved what they wanted to achieve was to become a principal, right? And that's the goal. It's a very selfish individual goal just to become a principal. If there's a bigger reason, if there's a, a rationale behind it about changing people's lives, about making a difference, that's a totally different beast. So one is we have to be very clear about our purpose in the first place. And it brings me, it reminds me of a quote, one of my favorite quotes, beware the traveler who believes he has arrived. Mm. I love that quote, man. It just, it speaks to the idea that you can't, you're not ever there. I mean, you're in a place, you're always in a place, you have to be mindful of where you are right now. And that's the second the second piece of advice that I have uh, for assistant principals is be the best damn assistant principal in the history of assistant principals. Yeah. If you want to become a principal, your number one strategy for becoming a principal is to be an amazing assistant principal and to go over and beyond. And I can tell you from my experience and most of the folks that I've worked with who have become principals is the principalship may have been a goal. It may have been a, a strategy for achieving a goal. It has never been the singular outcome, right? It's never been the only thing. So by, be, by being a fantastic assistant principalship principal, you put yourself in a position to be noticed and to be recognized and acknowledged and invited into that interview process or that consideration process for being a principal. So as an assistant principal, one of the things that you can do to become known and to become accomplished and to become to get on the radar is to is to volunteer additional tasks to do things beyond what you're assigned to do right and i know that every assistant principal's job description says uh, other duties as assigned yeah, right? so right, he's right. going to be assigned some of that dirty work and that stuff that nobody else wants to do do it with a smile on your face and do it with an understanding that you're doing it in order to change somebody's life and to make some situation better so when there's a and you've done this before, Kefele, right? There's a protein spill down on, on aisle whatever where a kid has lost his lunch or something and someone's got to go clean it up and the custodian's not answering the walkie-talkie. You just got to go do it, right? And the reason that you do it is not, well, I'm going to do this so they recognize me. It's I'm going to do this so that the school is clean, so the kids are, feel proud and safe to walk the hallways of the building. And by doing it that way, you will get noticed, yeah. Right? Folks, you, you complain about it and argue about it. I don't want to do that. That's not my job description. You do that. People are going to notice that, too. That's right. Because that's that's the same spirit that you got to have as as principal. I mean, I remember my mentor, Frank Garrity, in Washoe County, Nevada, was a uh, principal. And I remember he he hired me to be his assistant principal. And I showed up to work the first day, you know, shirt and tie got my shiny shoes i'm ready to go and he looks at me and he's he's wearing a shirt like this he's got no tie on he said he, he'll wear a tie as soon as it doesn't have to be like three feet too long to cover his belly but he says i'm not wearing a tie and he says look at my shoes and he's wearing work boots and he and he says to me he says pete you can look real nice if you want to or you can be a working principal you know you can be a working principal we got stuff to do we got work to do we can't be worried about you know how we're dressing real nice all the time he says we're workers we got stuff to do. And I just remember that that spirit of it's the magic isn't done in the office. It's done out in the, in the field. It's done out in the classrooms, in the hallway, in the playground. And that's where you got to, you know, put your boots on and get out there and get working. So that's one perspective is from the assistant principal perspective, from the principal perspective and from the district level perspective. If we want to build leadership capacity in our assistant principals, we have to give them opportunities. We have to give them opportunities to show up, show us what they can do, right? And, and believe in our assistant principals and their their opportunity to demonstrate whether they're worthy of a principalship at some point in their career, as opposed to what you, I think you were alluding to is when we pigeonhole our assistant principals into very specific job descriptions. So you're the assistant principal in charge of discipline. Yeah. You're the assistant principal in charge of instruction. 
you're the assistant principal in charge of that and that one duty, and that's your thing. And we limit our folks' opportunities to grow and to expand and to learn and to make mistakes and to learn from them and collaborate with many people. And, and a lot of us as principals and district level folks, we do that out of, I, I think it's a desire to be efficient. Like if we have one person in charge of discipline, then we know where all the discipline's going to go. And that person yeah. handles it all and never has to ask anybody else, hey, what's going on with this kid? Whereas if we allow for some overlap, that builds collaborative skills. It builds opportunities for us to team and to work together and to build that partnership. It gives opportunities for our assistant principals to grow and try different things that they haven't done before. I mean, I know a lot of assistant principals that are happy to do discipline because they're not comfortable with instruction. Well, guess what? The best thing for that person to do is to have an assistant principalship where you have some responsibilities with instruction so you learn those skills. You learn. Because as a principal... You have to know at least something about everything as yeah. a principal. That's so right. you can't not be doing something. So as principals, district district level folks, we just have to give our folks opportunities to stretch their legs, to stretch their wings, to show us what they've got, to ask questions, to get curious. I think that's what's going to make the biggest difference, those two things. That's a lot, there, and that's, that's, that's good stuff. You know, uh, let me say to the folks, hit the share button, folks, hit the retweet button. Let them know we're here. We're here. We're here. Hit that share button. Hit that retweet. Hit them Facebook groups. Let them know we are here. Pete Hall is dropping gems on us as it relates to building leadership capacity. So so going back to what you said, yeah, that that assistant principal that is limited capacity can't be built beyond that which you're doing. So there's got to be that exposure. And if and to use a specific example you use, if I'm not comfortable in, in instruction, instructional leadership, but I aspire to one day become principal. Well, if I'm not comfortable in that capacity, I'm probably never going to have a school that's a high performing school. And if it is, it will not be because of my leadership. Mm-hmm. It'll be despite my leadership. Right. Because I be, be, because that's an area where I don't feel proficient. I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel that I add value. So therefore, there's there's very little oversight as it relates to teacher coming from me into in my supervisory capacity. So I love what you said there. You know, so so therefore, consistent with that, Pete, you you were you were a, a, a extraordinary principal. You I read the bio, the awards, et cetera. You did big things in that capacity. Talk to us about the correlation between your own leadership capacity as it relates to the success of your students, your staff, and your school. Oh, gosh. Well, I appreciate that you said I've done big things. You know, I I, uh, I did the best I could with what I had in the moment. I'll say that. Yeah. And I, and I think that's the that's probably the spirit that has always driven me is, is two things. Do the best you can with what you got in the moment. You know, with what you know now, do the best you can. And strive to grow, strive to learn more, strive to be better, strive to have a greater impact. I mean, that's the, the title of my new book is Always Strive to Be a Better You, which is a, a mindset and a philosophy, a philosophy that I've always lived by. It's based on an old Greek principle of paideia which is different than the Paideia schools, uh, but not that different. The idea of Paideia, it comes back to the idea that I was referring to a a little bit ago of our potential continuing to expand the closer we get to it. So if we embrace that mindset that I want to learn more, I want to have a greater impact, I want to be happier, I want to find more joy in my life, that as I seek that, as I, as I explore the curiosity that drives that, my potential expands and ratchets up another notch, which allows me to have an even greater impact and to be able to, to influence even more people in more profound ways. And as I do that, and as I strive to, to have that positive impact on others, that spreads, that spirit spreads. And I, I can tell you, I was, I always really, really tried to be transparent as a leader to say, hey, I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm, I have not arrived, I am not the master of everything. Try to put together leadership teams of people that have skills that are different than mine and have expertise that is different than mine. 
folks that are smarter than I am. You know, I was told by one of my um, supervisors at some point, if, Pete, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. You need yeah. to get out of there. Yeah. <laughs> so, and bring some other people in there. So the spirit really is that idea of always just wanting to grow and to learn and to expand personally. And by doing that, I'm growing my teachers. I'm growing my assistant principals. I'm growing the, the parenting capacity. And that's not to say I'm a great parent and the, my folks are learning how to parent because of me. It's that I've inspired them and motivated them to ask themselves questions about their parenting or their teaching so that that trickles down to our kids because that's that's what all our work is about. It's about impacting our kids and changing the trajectory of kids and their families and, and moving things forward. So I think that has been just the biggest spirit is that curiosity and that willingness to grow and to learn and to never be satisfied with anything. Yeah. You know, that's one of my hashtags on social media, never satisfied. Hmm. You know, the, the, the day I become satisfied, you know, that's 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 like going it kind of parallels with that stopping something. And, and, and why did you start it in the first place? If I if if if, if I'm never satisfied, then I'm going to keep striving. I'm going to keep soaring. I'm going to keep growing. Right. But but once I reach that point of satisfaction, that's where growth ceases to continue. Right. So never satisfied is a hashtag that I use all the time. Right. In my social media, I got I got the book in front of me. OK, it's, there it is. Yeah. The principal influence. And Pete is one of the authors um, of this book. And it's a book I strongly recommend. I actually know a few of the authors on here and uh, I know their work. And you want you want to get this right. The principal influence. You can go right to Amazon and get it. So, 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 Pete, toward building leadership capacity, you and the co-authors, you, 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 um, the five areas you cover, following five areas. Principle is visionary. Principle as instructional leader. Principle is enga as engager. Principle as learner and collaborator. And reflective leadership awaits. So, each of these criteria, each of these have criteria that accompany them. I, I want to focus on principle as visionary. It has four, and I, I want to cover two of them as a part of this discussion. Let me read this first criterion for um, principle as visionary. Verbatim, it states, articulates, communicates, and leads the collaborative implementation and ongoing revision of the school's mission and vision. Let me read that to everybody a second time. And, and, and Renika Coleman said, best book ever. Wow. Let me put that on the screen. Right. That is generous. Appreciate that, Renika. So articulates, communicates, and leads the collaborative implementation and ongoing revision of the school's mission and vision. So I got a five-part question. I might have been a little ambitious with this, but let me let me let me see if we can get all this in in addition to the rest of the, the, the conversation. What what are your thoughts about a school? that either lacks a mission and vision or they exist as statements but have no real relevance to the school at all huh. honestly if yeah. if that's the situation i don't think that school's going anywhere and i don't think yeah. that and those have... schools exist and you know that oh yeah and yeah. I, I work in them and i I've, I've, <laughs> I've done work to try to support them as, as much as possible i want to share something with you too real quick before i answer that question in more depth because you showed up, you showed that that cover. Here's a, a similar cover of a similar. It's been translated into Chinese, which is kind of a cool wow. thing for an author to have your book translated in another wow. language. So that's well, neat. Well, 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 do this, do this for me. Um, what you got? Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Where are we at? Where are we? Here we go. Ah, uh, oh, I don't have it up here. It's, it's, it's on another show. My closing the attitude gap book was yeah. translated into Chinese, and and I saw it on Amazon and got scared. I'm like, wait a minute, they just lifted my book and translated <laughs> into Chinese. I called ASCD. They said, no, 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 no. It's it's legit. I was like, oh, okay, yeah. So good stuff. Good stuff. It is. It's kind of funny that to have that happen. And and Renika, I appreciate the the compliment. This book actually. Um, just a little background on this came out of a committee and I got a copy of this version. Yeah, too. Jolanda was asking. It came out of a committee that did a ton of work putting together this framework for principal leadership. And so this book really takes, takes a couple different tacks. 
So it's the, if you're an aspiring leader and you want to become a principal, there are ideas embedded in this book to support your growth for how to become a, a, an effective principal and things you can do. If you're a current principal, it gives you ideas about how to augment and streamline your leadership a little bit. And it also gives ideas from district level folks about how to cultivate a, a pipeline of leaders in your system so that there's some strategy and um, deliberate action in order to build leadership capacity across your system. So we're really excited about that. And the, the author team has been phenomenal. It includes uh, the late Deborah Childs Bowen, who passed away just a couple of years ago. Um, Anne Cunningham Morris was the, the lighting, the guiding fire, and you know, and uh, yeah. behind this project. And uh, Phyllis Pichardo and Elisa Simmerall, two people I've worked with extensively over the years. Elisa and I have partnered on, I don't know, five, six different books together okay. on reflective practice. Um, but to answer your question, the, the idea of a vision goes way beyond a phrase that goes on your website or on a poster someplace or something that somebody with a cool vocabulary or, or a thesaurus, you know, is wordsmith and written down. A vision is truly the, the mental picture of what it looks down, looks like down the road when you're achieving what you want to achieve. It's, it is that fire that burns inside you of, and what it looks like and how you know if you're being successful doing what you're doing. It is so much more than a phrase. It's a series of phrases. It's a series of pictures. It's imagery. It's, it's emotion. That's what a true vision is. So if you're, if you're interested in sitting down as a, as a team with a, a representation of leaders from different stakeholder groups in your organization or you get everybody together, however that looks for you in the most efficient way to do this. The, the questions that we always pose uh, in the work that I do with schools and districts is when this work goes spectacularly well, and that's the prompt I always use. I'm not, I'm not like, you know, when you achieve mediocrity, you know, what's it like? When, you, when this work goes spectacularly well, what will it look like? What will it smell like? What will it feel like? What's different? What's happening? How are kids' lives different? What is, what is the, the vibe in your community? How does that feel? And we want people to just paint that picture together and surface as many ideas as possible. And I, I run the folks through a very specific protocol in which we, we do that, we brainstorm that, we research them, some things, we have conversations, we engage in discussion and debate over a series of weeks. And then we come back and we refine that and, and whittle it down to the, the, the most impactful items and the ideas that, that we can achieve some kind of consensus and commitment towards. And that becomes the vision, not a not a statement, but it's a series of pictures. It's a series of feelings. It's something that we can own. And if you go back and you read that, would you do it again? Uh, yeah. Or would, will you read that? In terms, um, in terms of the criterion? Before? Yeah. Articulates, communicates, and leads the collaborative implementation and ongoing revision of the school's mission and vision. Yeah. It's a living, breathing document. And it's not something that you can do by yourself in a closet with a thesaurus. It's something that you do in a room open to people. And it's, it's not, so then as, as principal, it's not my vision. It's our vision. Mm -hmm. And it's, it becomes the foundation upon which we make all our decisions. It becomes the foundation upon, we which, uh, upon which we take all our actions. It becomes the, the rallying cry behind every morning, every day, every Sunday night when we're thinking, oh man, is it Sunday night already? Yeah. It becomes, oh, man, it's already Sunday night because tomorrow's Monday. We get to get after it again to work towards this vision. It gives us something so much deeper than just a day of work lurking around the corner. Right. So that and there's a reason that is the first criterion in the book, because that, like I said, that's foundation. If you don't have a vision, a clear and compelling vision that is shared by all stakeholders and that we built collaboratively. And that we're willing to look at and revise and talk about and refer to, then all our work is just, it, we're just spinning our wheels. We're just in the weeds. We're just sitting in traffic. Yeah. Right. And we got to, we got to get beyond that. So, you know, considering again, so many young administrators or aspiring administrators watch the platform, the virtual AP Leadership Academy, got a question for you. Who, who writes the mission statement? Who writes the vision statement? Where's that coming from? 
Are you talking about the ones that are posted on the wall? Yeah. Um, usually, usually that that happens when somebody sees this, for instance, or they they hear that we got to have a clear vision, and we bring a team of people together, and we talk about it a little bit, and then somebody starts writing some things down, and whoever has, you know, the the best vocabulary, whoever has you know writing experience tends to be the person who then scribes it and writes it and then we tinker with some words and some language and and then it it gets unveiled so it's almost like a a gender reveal party right where the, the kids are having a baby and so we're gonna we're gonna pop the balloon and it's whatever it's almost like an unveiling of this we're birthing a, a vision statement right so so then then it's a matter. Then so think about what happens then in a situation like that, where only a small number of people have built this vision statement together and written it, and crafted it. It might be beautiful. It might be perfect. It might be exactly what the school or district or organization needs. The problem is, it only belongs to a handful of people. Right. It's, and it's not everybody's. So when you've got something that only belongs to a handful of people and not everybody then that handful of people become salespeople. It's their job to sell others that, no, no, this is the vision that you want to work towards. This is our vision. And then it's either get on board or get out. Or it's, no, seriously, come on, do this. You can do this. And I'm trying to come up with all sorts of creative ways to sell you on the idea so that I get buy-in. And buy-in is not a phrase that I like using because that means I'm selling something. I don't have a lot of good experiences with yeah. people trying to sell me on something. What I want is connect, connection, I want commitment, I want consent to an idea, and the best way to do that is for us to build it together as opposed to somebody doing it off in a, in a side room or, you know, or a school board does it or a, a principal does it for the staff or something. That just, it checks the box of yeah. having it done. Yeah. And, and in a presentation, you could read it to folks and it'd be like, wow, that's amazing. But when it comes down to when the rubber hits the road in the schoolhouse, in the classrooms, in the small group instruction, you're not going to see that living and breathing. And that's that's where the difference is going to be. And that's and that's why I ask you the question, because I know that there are probably folks out there either on with us or we'll see this later or just folks out there in the world who think that the, 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 the one of the responsibilities of the leadership is to write the mission statement of the school or, or, or dropping the word statement to write the mission or to write the vision where it is not because, you know, you like, like you said, you were discouraged by buying and I, I tend to be discouraged by it as well. So, so, so therefore my word would be, how would staff take ownership of something that they had no involvement in creating? Right now, if they're all wrapped up into us, they I love the principal and everything he or she says and does, I'm down with it. Then fine, you got them folks, but that may not represent the entire building. So, right. so if I take a statement that I wrote and shove it to them and say, look, this is who we are. I may, I, I may not be able to generate that sense of ownership of this statement. So hence, I, I, I love the, the response you gave. It's, it's got to be collaborative. And then I see that some others on the thread have been writing the same thing, that all stakeholders, meaning all staff, at least are given opportunity. Even if I don't want to take the opportunity, at least I'm given opportunity to, to lend input to this particular, um, this particular project. And in this case, the mission and vision. Go ahead. Yeah. And can I just add a little bit to yeah, that? Absolutely. A little story. You know, I was a middle school principal in a building that had um, a lot of discipline. There was a lot of, a uh, lot of stuff going on that, you know, was frustrating staff and community and the school had a reputation that I heard about years and years before I ever became principal of that building. And one of the things that I found when I got to the school is that staff deeply cared about kids. Kids deeply cared about their futures. Kids deeply, or parents deeply cared about their kids and their lives and how that was going to go. And community members, you know, the local businesses and, and residents really wanted the school to do well and wanted it to be good for kids. And somewhere we ran afoul of each other because we had some competing ideas and ideals about what that was going to look like. So one of the things that um, we as a, as a staff kind of came together and as a leadership team came together and said, 
can we be clear about, yes, our, our mission and our vision and all that, can we be clear about our core values? Can we be clear about some things that we truly believe and that we can use as kind of some pillars around which we can focus our work and our interactions with each other? So we did it, uh, we engaged in an activity where we collected input from staff, from parents, from parent groups, and then we did an activity with our middle school kids in which we identified the top five core values that are most important to us. So things like unity came up, commitment came up, love surfaced, and we, and we then explored what that looks like in a school set, what that looks like in a community, what that looks like at the YMCA down the road, what that looks like at the grocery store when we're shopping with our families, right? And we explored that notion and came up with very vivid descriptions. Kids made posters, kids drew things. We had, we had all these amazing opportunities to show, well, what does love look like? If we truly do love each other, mm -hmm. and we're going to operate our school and our community off of this idea of love. What does that look like? What does that sound like? What does that feel like? How does that play out? You know, at the at the park down the road on Saturdays, what does that look like? I mean, do you have to have a, a teacher or a staff member supervising you to demonstrate love for your fellow travelers? How, how do we embody that? And I tell you what, that was one of the most powerful experiences that I've been through as a principal, having, mm -hmm. having kids have a voice in these things. And it changed the dynamic. I mean, not 100% by any means, but it changed the dynamic of how we go about just our day-to-day -day business of yeah. school, right? It just changes the feel of it. I just wanted to share that. Thank you for the yeah, No, I, I appreciate you sharing that. And I noticed some people on the on the thread in the chat have the same uh, level of appreciation. You know, you, you said, and I'm, and I'm moving quickly just because I want to get as much in as I can. You, you said, and I'm going to quote within what's well, stated in that criterion, articulates, communicates, co communicates and leads the collaborative implementation. My question is, what exactly does that articulation and communication look like and sound like? Like when when is that happening? And I'm, and I'm asking again, always considering the, the, the young leader, the inexperienced leader, the new leader. So that communication, that articulation of the mission and, uh, and the vision, what, what does that look like? When does that occur? What does it sound like? Talk to us. Well, in the spirit of um, uniformity, uh, it's a conversation that occurs often. So I'll give you a couple of examples. One of the, uh, first, I'll give you a counterexample. Counterexample would be when in August, all the staff comes back and we share the the mission statement or the vision statement and we, we put it up there and we have a, a slideshow and a nice conversation about it and, and we we rally the troops and we get all everybody excited and then we don't talk about it again until next august mm -hmm. and that's that's a default setting that comes up a lot well, remember our mission remember our vision and then remember because here yeah, you have to remember because it's been 12 months yeah. the opposite of that would be to infuse little pockets of conversation wherever and whenever possible, right? So we want to be intentional about at a, every faculty meeting, even if we just touch upon the mission and vision of why we're doing what we're doing. And when we're talking about a decision that we're going to make, we're adopting a new curriculum, we talk about why it's important for us and how it fits into our mission and vision for what we're trying to accomplish here. And, and it's not lip service, it's anchoring. It's being really clear and explicit about this is why we're doing this. Remember why? Or even just asking the, the question. Okay, so as we engage in this work today, how might this connect with our vision? Why is this important work for us to be doing? At your tables, have a quick conversation about that. And then every table share out an idea about how this connects back to our mission. It only has to take two, three minutes. Mm -hmm. And it allows everybody the opportunity to intentionally craft a, a picture of that vision and then connect it to the daily work. So as, as assistant principals, when we're talking with families about what's going on with their kids, when we're talking about students about what's going on with their peer interactions, when we're talking about, well, we're sitting in a team meeting where they're doing their planning for the upcoming unit, we weave in that 
that question about how does this fit in the bigger picture of what we're trying to accomplish? How does this, how does this demonstrate that our, our mission is real? And there's two different ways to go about that. One is we start with the activity and we try to make a connection to the mission. Two is we take our mission, we take our vision and we say, what are the best strategies that'll help us accomplish that and build this and create this? And then we identify the strategies that'll help get us there. And then when, once we've identified those strategies, that's when we want to make explicit those connections as often as possible. So it, it's just a matter more than anything else of keeping it in our prefrontal cortex, keeping it in our front and center, helping our, our people to remember that why. Because we, remember you and I and our principals and our assistant principals, and we motivate others. And we can motivate them to remain connected to their source of inspiration, which yeah. remember is all theirs. It's all yours out there. Yes. Yeah, that inspiration is yours. We can motivate you, stay connected to your source of inspiration. And that's what that mission and vision truly does. I love how you word that we, 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 we can motivate you, but that inspiration is yours, right? So, so, so the motivation may become the vehicle for you to get back to that inspiration that should be within you. Yeah. Right. Just think about it this way. If if the inspiration is is mine for you, as soon as I leave, your inspiration's gone. Yeah. Right. So if, if I'm your principal, I'm your assistant principal, I'm leading your team, and then I get a job in another district or I get a job at a different school and I'm no longer there for you on a regular basis. If I'm your source of inspiration, you've just lost your source of inspiration. So I can't be your source of inspiration. I can be the motivating factor, and I would ins- encourage you to get to find as many motivating factors as possible, find them out, keep your mirrors out, keep your feelers out, grow your network so that you've got them. I mean, you got our, our man, Dennis Griffin's on the call. I got him on speed dial and he's got me on speed dial. So when we need something, we just send a quick text, send a quick message back and forth. You got to have those people that when they connect with you, you then feel inspired because that, that, that person reminds you of your inspiration, yeah. right? That's what you need, a reminder. I love it. Reminder of your own inspiration. You know, um, I I said to you from the beginning, I was probably overly ambitious when I put these questions together. So looking at my notes here, it would take, it's it's, it's 1219 Eastern time right now. It would literally take us till two o'clock to get through this. I I, I work too hard in putting this together. So we definitely going to do a part two, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm not, but I'm not adjourning yet. I still got some, some questions for you, but I want to switch gears out of the whole mission and vision, which I still have about five more questions to ask. And I want to talk a little bit about instructional leadership, right? So, so looking at that, that, that second category of principle as instructional leader, there are four criteria that you all have in that book. And I, I want to look at the first criterion here, it, and I'm going to read it to you. It says, builds individual capacity of the entire staff through differentiated supervision, coaching, feedback, and evaluation practices. I want to read that again for the benefit of the audience. Builds individual capacity of the entire staff through differentiated supervision, coaching, <clears throat> feedback, and evaluation practices. So so my, my question to you, Pete, what is meant by differentiated supervision? The big idea behind that huge phrase is that each individual person that we supervise and that we work with and we support needs something a little bit different from us. And that... that uh, I mean, that speaks to the uniqueness of the human condition, that each one of us is different. We've got different skills, strengths, backgrounds, goals, ambitions, worries, fears. And we can and there's common threads. And and you know this because you've you've poked around in that book a little bit that there's we're also going to build collective capacity. So we want to build the collective capacity of the whole unit. We want to build collective capacity within each team or department of our teachers. And we, we must not neglect the individual. So that's why we intentionally get after the idea of each individual teacher. Because you think about we're supporting a team, we're supporting a department, we're supporting a grade level, and we plan together, we work together, we come up with resources together, we, we identify our goals and our strategies, we're, we're all planned out. And then 
what happens at the end of every team meeting? Everybody puts their hands in the center and say, all right, on three, go team. And then we go to our own classrooms. We go to our own settings and we go. The responsibility is now ours individually to, to live out the goals and the dreams and the plans that we came up with. So our responsibility then as capacity builders is to support individuals in carrying out the orders of the team to make sure that they're doing it as well as they possibly can to grow them so that our teachers remain curious, so that they remain reflective, so that they remain engaged in the work on the, on the daily. And it's, it's every teacher is going to need something different. So I can tell you, you know, you go down the hallway of a, of a school, you pop your head into one classroom and you just might need to ask, Hey, how's it going? You know, what's happening? Need anything? No. All right, go get them. You go in the next classroom and you might just, you might have to go up to that teacher and then do what I call um, in your ear coaching, which is where you kind of stand next to that teacher and in while it's live, while it's happening, you might be asking some reflective questions. You might be pointing some things out that are happening in the classroom, asking the teacher what his or her plan is for addressing that. What are we trying to accomplish right here? And just talk it through while it's happening. You might go in a teacher's classroom and that teacher wants you to just kind of stay out of it, kind of stay to the back, do some observation, talk to some kids, see what's going on. And then have a conversation with that person later, one-on-one, -on -one, when it's quiet, during a prep period. And every teacher needs something a little different. Every teacher has a different and unique relationship with you. What that will require of us as leaders and for you aspiring administrators out there, as aspiring assistant principals or as assistant principals, what that's going to require of you, of us as leaders, is to be willing to keep your eyes and your ears open and your mind and your heart open the entire time when you're working with folks with the curiosity to ask yourself and to ask the other person, what do you need from me? What can I do to augment your journey? What can I do to help strengthen your practice? What can I do to alleviate your concerns, to make you feel more confident, to build your efficacy? What can I do to help you become more effective? We need to be willing to step out of ourselves a little bit. To, in order to do that, we have to be willing to step out of ourselves, right? Because, Kefeli, you and I both know that, you know, we're smart guys, right? We know stuff. And as leaders, we've been through coursework that our teachers haven't been through. We understand the evaluation rubrics better than our teachers ever will. Yeah. And because of that, we tend to, to go into a situation thinking we know better. Or we know what should be happening. Or we have an idea of what effective instruction looks like, and this isn't it. So I'm going to tell you what to do differently in order to get there. I'll tell you what, that's not going to get them there. The best way for us to get them there is to realize they need something. Each teacher needs something. It's our responsibility to be curious enough to ask the question to find out what that is. And that's our, that's our challenge as administrators and as capacity builders is to be able to then pri provide it. And it's okay if we don't have all the answers. Remember, I told you before, I, I coach a stand-up comedian. I don't have all the answers to stand-up comedy. I wish I did. <laughs> you know, my timing's bad. My delivery's no good. I, I sometimes mess up punchlines by sharing them before the joke starts. I don't have to have all the answers. So in a classroom setting, I, I can coach a teacher that's teaching French, even though je ne parle pas français, right? I don't, I don't speak French. I can still coach a teacher by asking the right questions and being curious to say, what do you need in order to be successful? I can help you build it. So yeah. I think that's, that's the big, big piece right there is us being able to get out of our own way and ask the question, what does this person need right now? So, so here's, here, you know, I'm listening to you and, and I'm, and I'm loving everything you say, but now I'm, I'm putting myself like, like, let me be, let me be that young, that brand new, fresh out of the classroom, assistant principal, where I've never supervised an adult in my life. And now, except if I worked in summer school and now all of a sudden I'm responsible for 25 teachers. I, I, I supervise them. I coach them. I'm instruction. I'm the instructional leader of these particular teachers. So here, here so, so setting it up that way, here's my question. How do I develop a skill set or the capacity to be that differentiated supervisor um, or engage in differentiated supervision when 
this is so new to me. I, I've, I've been working with children as the teacher for years. And now everything you said, inclusive of what do you need, but how do I make this thing real in this new capacity? Yeah. I wish I had all the answers. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You, learn and grow, learn and grow, learn and grow, right? Uh, reflect on your practices and reflect on what you're actually trying to do and pay really, really good attention to how to do that. Another, another thing I want to bring into it is the humility that you bring to the table is going to be rewarded and appreciated. So if you go into that situation as a brand new assistant principal, brand new administrator, thinking, all right, I'm the boss now. You know, I got all the answers now. I'm in this position of authority. I got some, yeah. I got some, I got a title behind my name. I got some power behind me. That's not gonna, that's not gonna do you anything. If you go in with humility and you say, say to your people and say to it one on one, say to it, say it to them as a group, say, hey, this is new for me. And I want to do what's right for y'all. I want to do what's right for us. And I'm going to need your help. I'm going to lean on your expertise because you've been supervised by people before. You've been evaluated by people before. You know what works and what doesn't work and what keeps you going and what shuts you down. So help me with that so that I can provide the best service and support to you that I possibly can and be clear about what we're trying to accomplish. When what we're trying to accomplish is growth, you know, obviously it, it stems from student learning outcomes, right? We want kids to learn. We want kids to grow. We want to change their trajectory. In order for them to do that, our teachers have to be at their best. So our, our responsibility as, as administrators, as evaluators, is how can I help you be at your best? That's what I'm, that's what I'm here to, to do. My goal is not to make you do stuff. My goal is not to change you. My goal is to help you grow and evolve so that you can be at your best for kids. And if that's the spirit that you bring to the table, if that's the, the humility that you have, that will be repaid to you a hundred times over with folks who go to bat for you and folks who say, yeah, I'm going to grow. You ask me the right questions. I will reflect on that and I will grow as opposed to folks who are worried about, well, what does this person want me to do? How am I supposed to, to do my job and do the best job I can and worry about what this new evaluator needs me to do? And those shouldn't be two different things, right? They should be one and the same. And it should be about how do I grow? How do I, how do I learn more? How do I get better results? That's, that's what it should be about. So I need so as, as, as a new assistant principal in trying to figure out this new world that I've entered, call administration, call school leadership. I need a principal then that has the wherewithal to ask me, what do I need? Right. Not just teaching, 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 coaching, coaching, coaching. But at some point asking me as the administrator, this new administrator, what do I need? And, yep. if, and, and if I if, if, if I if I can see that I need help being able to differentiate my supervision based on the various the plethora of different skill sets of the various teachers on staff. Now, I, I, I'm probably in a better position to be able to engage with this principal to learn because I've got a principal who asked me to question. What do you need as yeah. opposed to imposing on me all the time? Here's what you need, right? So that's, yep, and what, that's, I, that's hard. what I'm getting from you. Yeah, and that's a hard thing for principals to do because I, you, know, you and I are both principals forever. And the, the thing is, as a principal, there's so much sitting on your shoulders. There's so much that you have to accomplish. And you need assistant principals that can do certain things so that you don't have them on your plate all the time. And yeah. so a lot of times we hire folks so that they'll get stuff done and we don't have to worry about it as much anymore. And being able to step out of ourselves as principals, too, to ask our assistant principals, what do you need? How can I help you grow? What are you feeling confident in? What are you worried about? By asking those questions and engaging in those conversations, it allows us to give them that opportunity to try new things, to grow, to be curious about stuff. And sometimes we, we need to be paying such good attention to our assistant principals that we need to also say, hey, here's something I've noticed about your practice. You're really strong in these areas and you could use some bolstering in these. That's why I'm going to move you out of 
your expertise in mathematics, you're no longer going to be overseeing the mathematics department. Now you're going to be overseeing the science department because that's an area that you need to grow in. You need to learn about. Yeah. And so one of the things that I've found that's really interesting, and, and you might find this interesting as well, is the idea that sometimes we know so much about something that our coaching is impeded as a result. Yeah. Because let's just say I'm an expert at stand-up comedy. I might get into a, a coaching relationship with a stand-up comic in which I start telling this comic, this is a joke you need to use. This is how you need to, to share it. This is the way that you, you know, use the punchline. And I'm stulting, stultifying that, that comic's growth. Because I know or feel like I know so much, I inject that into the situation. That's why I have a lot of folks that I've worked with. I, if they are a, a come to the school with a, a math background, they're going to oversee English. They're going to oversee the language department. They're going to oversee something that is totally foreign to them yeah. so that they're forced to grow and they're forced to ask the question, what do you need? As opposed to injecting, oh, I know what y'all need to do, so I'm just going to tell you. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Put them in an area where they can grow as opposed to an area where they've already got an expertise, but don't have an area, don't have an expertise in other facets of the building, including content. You know, I got one more for you. One more. And then we gonna have a part two at some point because I, I got a, I, I wrote a zillion questions. I don't know what I was thinking. I guess it was all them long flights and having so much time. On my <laughs> well, you and right. I could just rap for days. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm. Uh, let me use myself again. I'm that new assistant principal. I'm that new principal. I, I've been working hard to get here. I've been on the Saturday Academy and, and 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 reading the books and doing all that kind of stuff. And now here I am. I'm in the position. I'm in the building. And and unbeknownst to me, before I got it, I got stuff coming at me from all directions. The work is overwhelming. I feel inundated. I am questioning myself. Is this really how I want to live my life? I did not know that this thing was so com uh, complicated, complex, intricate. I, I did not know that. And now I remember listening to Kefele and reading Pete Hall's work. And they put all this emphasis on being an instructional leader. What? I don't have time to have pre-observation conferences. I don't have time to visit classrooms for substantive uh, uh, period, amounts of time. I don't have time for immediate feedback via post-observation conference. So my question is, with everything I just said about this new me, this new leader, how do I find or create the time to be this 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 leader who has this differentiated supervision mindset rooted in instructional leadership? I know that was a lot. That is a million dollar question. And uh, <laughs> I, I think my response might be a little provocative. And that's that. Uh, and you kind of answered it. You don't find the time. You don't find time. there's not extra pockets of time just sitting around waiting for you to do something. Right. Like I, I have yet to meet an assistant principal that calls me up and says, hey, hey, Pete, I got about 20 minutes before the next thing I got to do. Uh, there's nothing else going right. on. So, you know, what should I do? Uh, so there's no finding time. It's it's about creating the time. It's about prioritizing the time. The thing about time management that I have found is that time management really isn't about managing your time. It's about managing your priorities. Mm -hmm. So if, if you have, if you have it in your heart and in your vision and in your mission, it's about instructional leadership. It's about changing things for kids. And that's your locus. That's your focal point. That's, that's where everything else emanates. Then as you think about putting your schedule for the day together, it's about prioritizing the things that are your priorities. What are the things that are most important? Put those on your calendar and chunk times out for that. What I have found is the other stuff, so the discipline, the committee meetings, the getting together, calling these people back, responding to emails, filling out that report, doing all that stuff, you can piecemeal that stuff together later. And you have to. You have to piecemeal that stuff together later. There are certain things that can only happen during the school hours and the, that can only happen while instructions occurring in classrooms. And that's when you've got to be in classrooms. That's when you've got to be chatting with teachers. That's when you've got to be observing instruction. That's when you've got those things have to happen. 
during those windows. So it's a matter of, of scheduling your priorities. So put the things that are most important to, to you in chunks of time on your calendar and make those actually happen. Have those be so important that even though something's happening, these kids got in a fight. And so you got you to deal with them. Well, guess what? Those kids later this afternoon will still have gotten in a fight this morning and you can still have a conversation with them and you can still levy the consequences and you can still make contact with parents later. It does not have to happen immediately. It doesn't. The things that have to happen immediately, the things that make the biggest difference, those are the things to put in your calendar and chunk times out for those. And, and I, have, I have wrestled with folks who, who argue about time all, all day long. They'll argue about, I don't have time, I don't have time. Meanwhile, should have gotten some stuff done. The, the thing, it really comes down to the idea of you don't find time, you make it. You create it, you prioritize it, and that's where the difference is going to be made. Those of us who are effective in prioritizing our schedules are the ones that get stuff done. Yeah, I love it. You make time. You don't find time. Right. Managing your priorities, not managing your time. Great stuff. Great stuff. And Pete, we took it. We took it to the end for for now. I'm gonna hold on to these notes. Well, they're in the they're in the computer they're in the file because I, you know, it's it's interesting, folks out there. You know, you you, you always you 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 always want to just over plan, right? You don't want to under plan, right? You want to over plan, and uh, that way you're you're always ready. So I, I, you know, I'm on long flights all week, and I'm I'm pulling out this book, which I'm gonna put on the screen again, the principal influence. And I'm generating all these questions. Would you believe I haven't even gotten to the halfway point yet? It's, 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 it's so much here. So we'll, you know, we'll use it again at another time. But I want to go to those rapid, uh, rapid fire, bam, impact questions. These are one question. I mean, one, an one, one word answer or one sentence answer. No, no, no long answer on these. Just got to think quick and give right. me this. It's 21 of these. Here we go. Oh, Education on the right path for underserved children on the right path yes can true equity occur in america's schools for black brown and other underserved students it has to does pete hall's work contribute to the progress we desperately need i'm trying man doing the best i can with what i got if you could do a reset on your life pete would your line of work be different or the same I'd be a professional baseball player, so that'd be different. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you continue to do this work? To make a difference. What fires you up within the work that you do? Growth, growth and capacity. What do you love about the work you do? Seeing, just seeing change, seeing change happen at positive productive. I know it's more than one word, but seeing positive productive change actually happening. Yeah, no, you're good. Sentence is good. What do you dislike about the work you do? Now, as someone who does what you do and, and uh, works and speaks and travels is I don't necessarily get to see the, I don't, the embedded, the, the long lasting chance, the yeah. relationships, the connect, yeah, that's part of it. That's, I miss that. Yeah. Yeah. What has been your greatest victory in this work? Uh, Anderson Elementary School in Reno. What was your greatest mistake in this work? Uh, every once in a while, believing that I had an answer. Good one. What has been your greatest challenge in this work? Uh, overcoming mindsets. Are you proud of your first year as an assistant principal? Yes, I am. Are you proud of your first year as a principal? Very much. Who inspires you in this work? You. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I don't say that lightly. Uh, you and, you know, people, people who have lived in the in the fire and have been in the trenches and and know what it takes to make a difference. And, and you're out there and you're living this and you're sharing it and you're breathing it. You inspire me. Dennis Griffin Jr. inspires me. Tammy Campbell inspires me. Jennifer Gross, the head women's basketball coach at UC Davis. She inspires me. I mean, I got a, a litany of folks that that I lean on for that. I guess it's not inspiration as much as it is um, a motivation to, yeah. to remind me of my inspiration. And that, 
I, this work is too hard to do by yourself. You cannot cook up yourself right. and, and try to be successful. So yeah, I appreciate you, you and a list of people. I appreciate you. Um, what are you reading right now? I'm reading a book called um, The Baseball 100. And you'll, you'll get a kick out of this. It's the top 100 baseball players, according to this uh, researcher. And he has come up with a, a splendid way of merging old Negro Leagues players with major league players. And there are some surprises in his top 100 list. You might be interested wow. in that. Wow. Where's this book at? I'm, uh, I'm trying to, since you said it, I'm interrupting everything now. But thanks. Uh, uh, shades, shades of Glory. Yes, which is and it's a it's a thick one on on the Negro Leagues uh, satchel page on the cover. I'm trying to it's, it's you know, it's a summer grind, so it's hard. But uh, yeah, that's that's interesting what you just said in terms of how we merge that. Come up with a top 100 and where would a satchel page, where would a Josh Gibson, where would a cool Papa Bell, where would a Buck Leonard, Buck O'Neill and so on? Where would they fall within that top 100? when you look at what those what what those players did in the negro league so so let me keep going because we could have a whole conversation all there. Right, right. um so what do you want to accomplish that you haven't accomplished yet oh man um honestly uh i just I, more just want to have more impact just more and greater impact it's, i just don't want to stop yeah are you satisfied with where you are professionally now? <laughs> Never. Beware right. the traveler who believes he has arrived. I, I don't right. want to be that guy. Never satisfied. <laughs> what could you say to a viewer out there who continues to face closed doors? Keep knocking. And there's always a window. There you go. What could you say to a viewer out there who's lost their fire? You know what? The thing about burnout, and, and I'm going to use the term burnout, um, Burnout happens because we've our fire has gone out. It's just a matter of rekindling when it comes back to that. And it's just go back and ask yourself, get that mirror out and ask yourself, why did I start this in the first place? Why was this important enough for me to get going? Why? What's your why? There it is. Get that mirror out. And as I always say, and once you get it out, stay locked in. No, right. All right. we, yeah, <laughs> I, I got all sorts of props sitting over here. Yeah, you got you got to lock in, baby. <laughs> Lock it down. And then last one, Pete. If Pete Hall was a word in a dictionary, what would be your definition? Incorruptible. Incorruptible. That's a strong one. Incorruptible. That's I need to make that my word. Incorruptible. It's going to be kids first every time. It's going to be what's in the best interest of that person every time. It's not going to be what's in my best interest. That has always been the spirit of my leadership and my teaching. That's been in the, that's the spirit of my coaching work is it's in what is in your best interest. You're not going to sway me from that. And I think that's the thing I got in some trouble. I got some awards back in the day as a principal. I always got in some trouble as a principal because I made decisions based on what's best for kids as opposed to what's comfortable for grownups. And that, you know, that ruffles feathers and we can sleep well at night knowing that's why we made our decision. So incorruptible, I borrowed from a statue of Sam Adams at Faneuil Hall outside of, outside of Faneuil Hall in Boston. And, and I fell in love with that term. I said, that is, that's the one that I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to die on that sword. You know, I love it. And you, you just said something that inspired something in me, I guess to use your vernacular though, that motivated something in me um, before I close out, hold on folks, before I close out, um, you talked about, and I, I don't need you to go into specifics at all. I don't even need you to, to address this, but you said you got into trouble. Folks on here that have been with me for a while know that I got into trouble. There are others of us who have gotten into trouble. I think that at some point I need to put together a panel of folks who are not in districts because, you know, they if they're still in the district, we don't want to talk about those issues. But if they're out of the district and won't be haunted by them, then I, I, I may want to bring on like five, six, seven people. And we talk about some of those things that got us into trouble because like, like you just said about yourself, you were just working in the best interest of kids. I was working within the best interest of kids and got myself in a heap of trouble. Right. But I'm proud of it. I'm, I'm extremely proud of the trouble I got in. So, there, so, so there's some other folks out here in the universe that I'm aware of that got themselves into trouble 
but we tend not to talk about these stories. And we probably need to because there's some younger folks on the call and beyond who are <laughs> going to get into trouble at some point and may not know how to maneuver once they get in it. So, mm. you know, so be on the lookout. I may just put that panel together and we talk about some of those experiences that we had. But other than that, hey, folks, if you enjoy Pete Hall this morning, this afternoon, put some fire on, put some bombs, put some put you know, some hearts, put up whatever emojis, you know, some diamonds that you love. To let him know that the time spent this morning was worthwhile. But with that, while you're doing that, Pete, talk to us about how to get in touch with you, how to follow you, how to book you, all those things, how to get the books, everything. Yeah. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you. I appreciate that you uh, invited me. I'm honored to be a, a guest on your show today and keep me on the short list of any any few future episodes you think I could be helpful. Yeah. Uh, I've gotten in quite a bit of trouble. So I'd be more than happy to help folks learn how to navigate that. Uh, I am most active on Twitter, as far as social media is concerned, at Education Hall. And if you're interested in, uh, in my work professionally, you could probably start by going to educationhall.com. That's your, that's your best bet for getting started with me. Uh, my email is petehall at educationhall.com. And... Uh, yeah, that's probably your, your easiest way to just go sh straight at that stuff to, to get a hold of me. Most of my books are available through the website, or at least there's links to where you can get them at my website. Um, and I, like you, I'll be on a lot of long flights. I was in five different towns in the last week, and mm. it's, uh, it's not glamorous work, but I believe it makes a difference, and that's why we keep doing what we're doing. And uh, I want to Quick shout out to all the folks out there that have been with with you, Principal Cafele, for 112 weeks. I know you started this right as the pandemic hit, and you're like, yeah. I want to do something for people. Yeah, put this out there, and that spirit of giving, that spirit of giving your time and your energy. I mean, folks, this is my one visit in 112 weeks. Principal Cafele has been here 112 consecutive Saturdays. Right? You haven't missed one, have you? Never missed one. No. And talk about dedication to you as viewers and as learners and as future leaders and as leaders and contribute that is that is incredibly commendable that you've done that and it's, I appreciate it's really, it. really impressive and and see like like people don't realize like here's here's a page here's another page i mean this this is this is notes y'all this is like you know i'm not just i'm not just on here winging this stuff you're not right? winging it no it's 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 notes. It's, I still here's one here's one more, right? So it's like I'm I'm working, man. You know, it's it's, but that's that's what it takes, you know. And um, and when you put that kind of effort into your, your craft, then you become better at it. So as as I always say, Pete, God, before we close out, <laughs> you hit it out, grand slam, <laughs> out the park. You know, the group I spoke to Thursday in Louisville, they they felt. The, the, I think the best gift to give them would be a bat. So this no one, way. I, I got this from Jefferson County, but they gave me a beige one. So they had to ship it. So now I'm going to have two of them from the same city. So uh, that'll be sitting right here too. And uh, Louisville Slugger from Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah, so we just alternate them, you know. But um, <laughs> but other than that, man, I, I appreciate you. I appreciate you being here. appreciate all the – all the all the information that you shared today with the folks and we my wife just said great stuff and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do that we're gonna do the rest of this because i got to get all these other because i got so much more that i want the folks to hear but but let me let me close out pete when i close don't don't leave me just stay there folks yeah. uh let me let me thank everybody on the thread and those of you who are not on the thread but out there thank you for being here for week 112 um and and i'm excited about this this whole platform and we keep it going. So next Saturday, I'm back for 113. You know, I got a guest coming on. I hope she's still here. I think I saw her name. I'm not sure. But I got a guest coming on. This is going to be a little different. She's she's from the Rich uh, Richmond County School District in Augusta, Georgia. Principal Stacy Mabry. I've been knowing her for years and um, been at her school. But here's what's different about it. If I'm not mistaken, Every principal that I've brought on this platform is also a speaker and consultant, if I'm not mistaken, except for my first one, Vincent Stallings, Dr. Stallings. But since the first guest a year ago, every all the principals have been consultants as well. They, some of them are still practitioners, but they speak, right? Whereas this principal I'm bringing next week, this is not a speaker. 
This is not a consultant. This is a this is just a, a, a woman that goes into her school, takes care of business, goes hard every day, and goes home. Right? She don't she don't she don't jump on a plane and go somewhere and train people. This is this is so I'm bringing somebody on here next week that just all she knows is being a principal. Right? So that's Principal Stacy Mabry. I'm looking forward to her her visit, and I know this is going to be different for her because she's not a speaker. You know, she's not a she's she's she's, she's not a consultant. So this will be a different avenue, but I know she's going to hit it out the park like Pete did today. So be here next Saturday at 1055 Eastern Standard Time. Don't forget, every Saturday we got this, you know, we got this 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 foursome going. It's, it's Sean Hurt, Principal Hurt at 10 o'clock Facebook Live, all of these. Then Create and Educate with Dr. Sheika Houston and Dr. Tammy Taylor. I'm saying doctor now, Tammy, at 1030. And then um, Josh Tovar and Dean Packard on Sundays at seven. And then we, and then I threw a fifth in here village leadership group with Dr. Rise Gaskins and coach Williams every Tuesday and Thursday at six. So, you know, that's, that's my little family is I'm, I'm sure there's a zillion people out here that wish I would add there, but you know, this, this, my little family, make sure that you get again, the equity in social justice, education, 50, the assistant principal, 50, the aspiring principal, 50, and then Pete's book, this is one, he's got 12. The Principal Influence put Pete Hall in the search on Amazon. Just write Pete Hall. And then everything he's associated with is going to come up, right? So just put his name. Don't, don't just look for this book. Just put his name and you'll see everything. And then the new book will be here very soon, right? Uh, visit principalcafele.com for all my resources. Subscribe. This is important, y'all. Subscribe to virtual ap leadership academy on youtube I'm, I'm quite pleased with the number of followers i have on there 15 uh over 15 000, 15.6 to be exact but i want to take it higher because there are more than 15 000 ap's in america right so um subscribe to that channel you can watch all you've missed on that channel like and follow the Facebook page, Virtual AP Leadership Academy, because for the past 70 consecutive weeks, I've written a commentary. So I write a commentary that's, a, that's usually just an extension of the Saturday Academy. Every Sunday morning, I get up early, I sit over here and write the commentary, and then post it not later than 10 o'clock, right? So make sure you like and follow that page so you can get the notification that the commentary is there. And then take care of yourself. Diet, exercise, COVID precautions. I posted the other day. I'm going to just say it real quick. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm on a lot of flights, y'all. When it's connections, I could be on 10 planes a week. And and, and look, I'm, I'm old school with, with COVID. You know, it's COVID's new, but I'm going to call myself old school. I don't wear a mask everywhere I go. I don't wear a mask when I take pictures. My wife, you know, she don't like that. She's standing right here. But... But I take I pull it down, take it off, then put it back on. But but here's the thing. The airplane. I don't even wear a mask most of the time walking through the airport unless I'm amongst just a big crowd. But the airplane, I wear a mask. Let me tell you what burns me up. <clears throat> the person on the plane with no mask that's going to cough and sneeze for the entire flight. That burns me up. Now, yesterday... The person sitting next to me was coughing. Now, I'm fired up because I don't have an N95 on. I just got the, the surgical joint, right? Y'all can handle that slang joint, right? So the person's coughing. I got an attitude. So I, I lift up to look and see is there any seats on any anywhere else that I could sit on this plane so I don't have to be next to this person who's not considerate of me. See, me wearing the mask is not to protect me. It's to protect the person sitting next to me. If I cough, if I sneeze. So I want that person, give me the same consideration. You sitting out there coughing, not cuffed, got a blanket on. Y'all saying, man, he going deep at the end. Listen, no, no. The, the, it was cold on the plane, so the woman had a blanket on. Her arms under the blanket. When she coughed, it was this. <laughs> Ain't no this. Ain't no this. It was. Uh, I'm like, yo, it got to be another seat on this plane somewhere. I sit in the aisle. I sit in the bathroom. So, so let me stop venting, y'all. My point is, 
if you fly, put the mask on to prevent others from getting sick from you. I know that makes sense. Tony said, thumbs up, right? So other than that, y'all, I see you next Saturday at 1055. Thanks for being here. Have a great week. Have an extraordinary week. Have your best week yet. Peace. Peace. Thumbs up. Cock that fist back. Wait, I can't say one, two, three yet. Happy Father's Day to the dads out there, man. I, I would, Man, I would have been remiss. Happy Father's Day to the dads. It's Juneteenth. I'm not into happy Juneteenth. That's not me. That's not my language. It's just... It's Juneteenth. Recognize it. If you don't know what it is, study it, learn it. If there's a celebration in your area, attend it. But I just don't put happy next to Juneteenth. But that's just me. But it is Juneteenth, I, and I acknowledge it. I, I, I appreciate it. I support it. But I, I ain't into the happy. I say happy for your birthday, but I ain't saying no happy Juneteenth, right? So with that said, I will see you next week. Cock that fist back. One, two, three. Bam! Bam. That's it. See you Saturday. Be safe out here.